In this video, I'm going to talk about axial loading. Additional videos and references can be found at svainvent.com. Axial loading is a force that is normal to the part's central axis. There are two types of axial loading. Tension, which is when the part is being pulled apart, and typically when you write this out, you write it as a positive number, and compression, which is when the part is being pushed together, and typically you write this as a negative number. If you do not write these as positive or negative numbers, you should specify that the part is in tension or compression. Before I get into the main parts of axial loading, I want to talk about St. Venant's principle. St. Venant's principle doesn't just happen for axial loading. It can happen for torsion and bending as well, but it is easier to show for axial loading. First, the stress for axial loading is your force over your area, which means that you should have a constant stress when you have a constant area and a constant force. However, because of St. Venant's principle, you have an anomaly at your fixed end. And this anomaly is your stress is not constant. Instead, it will display different stress values. You can only see this when you do a finite element analysis, which you see here. Otherwise, when you do the normal calculation, you will get your nominal stress, which is constant across most of the bar. Now I'm going to talk about how you would calculate the deflection of a bar that is under axial loading. To calculate deflection, you would use the equation shown here. The equation shown here is your force times your length divided by the area times Young's modulus. It is important to note that the deflection equation shown here only takes in consideration of a constant area. If your area is not constant, you would have to use calculus to modify this equation so that it would take in consideration of the change in area across the length. Or you could use a finite element tool and have that calculate your deflection for you. The next equation here is used to calculate the stiffness of an axial loaded member. There are two ways that you can calculate stiffness. If you know what your force and deflection are, you can take your force over your deflection to calculate the stiffness. However, if you don't know those, you can take area times Young's modulus over length to calculate the stiffness. There are a couple reasons why you'd want to calculate stiffness. The first reason would be is if you don't know what your force or your deflection is, you can still calculate the stiffness of the part to get a general idea of how it's going to behave. And then once you get a specification of what your force or your deflection is, you can use stiffness to relate them to one another. Another reason why you would need stiffness is if you're doing a vibrational analysis. You would need stiffness to be able to calculate what your natural frequencies are. There can be situations when a part could be under multiple axial loads. Basically, when the part is under multiple axial loads, you need to realize that these loads have an effect on one another. And also, you need to realize that all of these loads should sum up to zero. If they don't sum up to zero, basically that part is going to go in the direction of whatever force is greater due to Newton's law. To show how the forces affect one another, I display it in a graph, and I also have three free body diagrams. To create a free body diagram, you need to have an understanding of statics, which is basically what I had explained earlier on this slide, is your forces need to sum to zero. As you can see here, the section AB and the section CD mainly relate off of these two forces. So in section AB, you're going to have a compressive force of 4 kilonewtons, and for section CD, you're going to have a force and tension of 6 kilonewtons. Where it starts to get interesting is for this section BC. To calculate the section BC, you need to take an account for the 4 kilonewtons, subtract 12 kilonewtons out of that, but then you need to have this equal to zero, which in this case is 8 kilonewtons. 
So the force on this section is 8 kilonewtons in tension. Okay, now I want you to try to solve this problem. For this problem, I want you to show the force distribution graph, which is what I showed on the previous slide. I want you to calculate the stress at each section. I want you to calculate the deflection of each section. And I also want you to calculate the stiffness of each section. After you've done all of that, I want to know if any of these sections are going to yield due to the force placed on them. I suggest you pause the video and try to solve this problem on your own. To show the force distribution graphically, you would have to use statics. Recall statics is summing your forces so that they equal out to zero. If you were to sum all the forces acting on this part, they would equal zero. So for section AB, you just have 7 kip, which is 7,000 pounds acting on it, and it happens to be acting on it in tension. So on your graph, you should have 7 kip as a positive number. For section CD, you have 21 kip acting on it in tension. So on your graph, for section CD, you should have a you should have 21 kip as a positive number. Now for section BC you would take 7 kip minus 15 kip and since that doesn't equal zero you have to find a number that will make it equal zero which happens to be 8 kip and notice that puts this in compression so it would be negative 8 kip in section BC on the graph. Now that you know what the forces at section A, B, B, C, and C, D, you can determine what the stress is at each section. To determine the stress at each se section, you would have to calculate the area at each section. Once you know the area at each section, you can calculate the stress. So for section A, B, it would be 7,000 pounds over 0.79 inch squared, which equals 8,860 psi or 8.86 KSI, and since your yield stress is 60 KSI, it will not break. Now for section BC, you would have negative 8,000 pounds, since it's in compression, divided by the area of 7.07, .07, which would equal negative 1.13 KSI, and similar for section CD, you would have 21,000 pounds in tension, divided by 3.14 inches squared, which would equal 6.69 KSI. And, like with section AB, neither of these sections will yield since the yield stress is 60 KSI for aluminum. To calculate the flexion, you would have force times length divided by area times Young's modulus. Recall from the question that your Young's modulus is 10 MSI, which would be 10 million PSI, and the length is 2 inches for each section. So for section AB, you would have 7 kip times 2 inches divided by 0.79 inch squared times 10 msi, which would give you 1.77 times 10 to the negative third inches. For section BC, you would follow the same process, except your force would be negative 8 kip, and your area would be 7.07 .07 inch squared. So your answer would be negative 2.26 times 10 to the negative fourth inches. And for section CD, your answer would be 1.34 times 10 to the negative third inches. To calculate stiffness, I would use the equation force over deflection, or I could use the equation area times Young's modulus over the length. In my case, I used area times Young's modulus over the length since in some cases you may not have the force or the deflection to calculate the stiffness. So for section AB, I had 0.79 inch squared times 10 MSI divided by 2 inches, which equaled 3.95 times 10 to the 6 pounds per inch. For section BC and CD, I repeated this process. And for section BC, I got the answer of 35.4 times 10 to the 6 pounds per inch, and for section CD, I got 15.7 times 10 to the 6 pounds per inch.
From this video, you should now have an understanding of how to calculate stress, deflection, and stiffness for an axial loaded member. You should also have an understanding of how to deal with an axial loaded member that has more than one axial load placed on it. My next video will be about statically indeterminate axial loaded members.